really just uh, encouragement as much as anything else. I know the, the days are getting longer and the evenings are pretty, and um, we're now uh, just two more lessons to finish Matthew's gospel, really, and then uh, we'll have our share night at the end of the year. But uh, this is really the climax of, of Matthew's gospel, and I would just encourage you to hang in there these last two weeks. The crucifixion that we'll look at next week, the resurrection to follow, that's, that's what Matthew's Gospel has been pointing toward, and we've been looking at it all year, you know, kind of coming at this, uh, this climactic last couple of chapters here. So I uh, encourage you, too, if, if uh, you've got friends that you think might be interested in attending BSF next year, they could certainly come and join us for the next couple of weeks. You could invite them and let them know that we're going to be talking about some of the physical aspects of the crucifixion next week, and, and they could certainly join us for that and get registered for next year. Um, one other announcement about what's going to be happening this summer, BSF is going to have a, a first time in two years meeting of, of uh, all the teaching leaders and also the school program leaders from around the world are going to be meeting in Arlington. So it'll be uh, roughly 2,000 people uh, that are going to meet there. The, children's, the school program is undergoing a major revision, uh, and so the school program Supervisors are going to be brought up to speed on that, and then the teaching leaders, uh, I'll be there as well as my wife, um, along with about a thousand other teaching leaders from around the world to uh, kind of get prepped for next year's study on the uh, uh, people of the promised land, kingdom divided. So if you would like to contribute specifically to the cost of that, BSF underwrites the travel expenses for teaching leaders from all over the world and their lodging and so forth. So there'll be people there from Africa and South America and Europe and, and so on. If you would like to contribute specifically to that, uh, the bsfinternational.org uh, website, there's a, a button right up the top, giving. You can click on that, and then there's an option to give to leaders' events. And so uh, if you would like to, you can certainly feel free to contribute directly to that. That's kind of the big calendar item for, uh, for BSF this summer. I think that is it as far as announcements. Let me uh, pray for us, and we'll... We'll get into the lecture, Father, uh, as we have just celebrated Easter and what uh, great timing that we're in just about that same place in Matthew's Gospel looking at the uh, arrest uh, tonight and in Jesus' uh, trial before both the Jewish leaders and Pilate. Uh, we pray that uh, we wouldn't miss anything that you have for us in the uh, wrap-up of this lesson this week and, and in the coming week as we look at the crucifixion at uh, you would encourage us, challenge us, convict us where we need any of those things. And uh, we ask that in your son's name. Amen. Well, it really was the high point of the Christian calendar yesterday, wasn't it? Uh, celebrating the, the empty tomb, the resurrection. Um, it just, uh, I mean, Christmas is great, but, but Easter is really the focal point of our, our faith, isn't it? If, if there was uh, not a resurrection, um, we really should be looking for something else to center our life on. If there was a resurrection, if the tomb was empty, uh, that, that changes everything. Uh, if that promise is true, then all the other promises that Jesus gave and that are recorded for us in Scripture are also true. So uh, we're right in the middle of these last three chapters, and as I said uh, just in the encouragement before we prayed that, that uh, this is really the climax, everything that has been in the preceding 25 chapters is really leading up to chapters 26, 27, and 28, which is right in the middle of that here tonight. Um, the Last Supper, the struggle in the garden, the arrest, the trials, the, the flogging, the crucifixion, the resurrection. That's all in these last three chapters. And, and I think this past weekend kind of reminds us of how fast all of that happened. I mean, you get the low point uh, on Friday with, with Jesus arrest and crucifixion, and then Sunday you've got the empty tomb and, and the beginning of the evidence for the resurrection. Um, we can't move that fast in our lessons, so <laughs> it's going to take us two weeks to get to the resurrection. But the lecture tonight's going to be a little bit different. Um, we'll, we'll move through the text, but, but I'm going to give all the principles at the end. Uh, we'll still have an outline, but, but the principles are going to be tied to specific people this week rather than a specific point in the, in the text. So a little bit different than the usual format. Um, outline was up a minute ago. We'll just put it up again. Uh, for those of you that, that didn't get it, we'll just kind of break it into two divisions, the arrest and the Jewish trials, and then Jesus before Pilate, uh, 2711 through 
27, verse 31. So we pick it up uh, kind of in the back half of chapter 26, verse 47, still in the Garden of Gethsemane, we're told that there's a large crowd that comes to arrest Jesus. Now we look at the other gospel accounts, and the presumption has been that, that there were Roman soldiers uh, there. As we look at the different gospel accounts, the term soldiers is, is given in one of the accounts. It, it, it's not entirely clear that they were necessarily Roman. We, we know that there were temple guards there. I think the key point to take away is that this was a large group. They were not expecting Jesus to be arrested without a fight, and they were prepared, and they were well armed. Um, it, it was not going to be a, a fair fight if it came to that. And Judas um, identifies Jesus with this prearranged sign, with a kiss. And you might ask, well, why was there a need for a sign? Well, Probably a few reasons. One, um, it was dark, and, and while Jesus was a well-known figure, probably recognized fairly readily in Galilee where he had spent most of his public ministry, he was not necessarily so readily recognized. Not all the people that were in that crowd would have necessarily had an up-close look at Jesus prior to that evening. So I wanted to make sure they arrested the right person. Um, G Judas... Uh, identifies him as rabbi, which of course means teacher. That seems to be as far as Judas was willing to go. He doesn't identify him as, as Lord. He identifies him as teacher. I think we just have to be struck by, by Jesus' remarkable compassion for Judas throughout not only this incident here, but the preceding uh, few days. Um, we read in John's Gospel that, that uh, at the Last Supper that Jesus washed the disciples' feet. He also washed Judas' feet. And he shared the Last Supper with him, and he, he identified that one of the twelve was going to betray him. And of course, Ju Jesus knew who that was, and Judas knew who that was, but there was another opportunity for Judas to, to repent. Um, he allows this kiss to take place, which was a standard Middle Eastern greeting of two men that, that were acquainted, that were friends, and he even identifies Judas as friend. I mean, it's just remarkable that, that he's going to be betrayed by this man, and yet he's extended him so many gracious opportunities uh, right up to the very last. And we read in verse 51 that it was one of Jesus' companions that reaches for his sword, draws it out, and strikes the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. We assume. We learned from the other gospel accounts that it was Peter, and we assume he was aiming for the, the servant's neck, and he, he happened to get his ear. But um, this could easily have turned into a riot, couldn't it? Um, I mean, you have to admire, uh, to some extent, Peter's bravery in this setting. He had said earlier he was prepared to die with Jesus, and this, this was not going to be a fair fight. They were not going to win this fight if it came to that. But uh, Jesus... We read again from the other gospel accounts, actually healed the man's ear and undoubtedly saved Peter's life uh, in, in the process and, and averted a riot. Um, he is rebuked. Peter is in verses 53 and 54. Jesus asked, do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Now a legion, 6,000 Roman soldiers, so you, you do the math, that's 72,000 angels. Um, all of a sudden the balance of power <laughs> potentially shifts pretty dramatically, doesn't it? I mean, there was no way that that, uh, that many angels would have any difficulty dispatching whatever size militia they had sent to arrest Jesus. So from a human standpoint, you know, the, the disciples are confronted with what appears to be an overwhelming force. That was nothing compared to the force that Jesus could have marshaled just with a word if he had summoned uh, 72,000 angels, but he doesn't. He doesn't summon any angels, and even his disciples leaving him, which we read in verse 56, that, that the uh, disciples all desert him and, and fled. Uh, even that detail was prophesied. Uh, Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7 says, Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And that's exactly what happens here. Um, you know, as you read this, and, and as we move forward through what is a sequence of events happening very rapidly here, you sort of get the, the sense, at least on the first reading, that men are in control of what's happening here, that things are kind of spiraling downward for Jesus and, and other people are dictating exactly what's happening. It's really the opposite. 
isn't it? Jesus is in control of all of these events. Um, and, and two things are becoming clear. One is that Jesus' death was by his own choice. He didn't have to come to Jerusalem when he did the week before Passover. He didn't have to ride into town on a donkey and have people laying palm branches and shouting Hosanna. And he didn't have to clear the money changers out of the temple and inflame the Jewish leadership, which was already inflamed against him. He didn't have to teach in the temple every day right under the noses of the, of the Pharisees. And even in the Garden of Gethsemane, which we looked at last week, I mean, he could have slipped away and, and avoided arrest, uh, but he didn't. And now, you know, he could have called down an overwhelming force of angels and dispatched this, this group that was there to arrest him, but he didn't. Um, Jesus wasn't going to die because men killed him. He was going to die because he chose to die. And the second thing that's becoming clear was that, or that, that is becoming clear, is his death was fulfilling his father's plans. And multiple prophecies, we'll look at some this week and, and more next week, but it all happened in the way that it was supposed to happen. So the, the human perspective that we might read it by the first time through where things seem to be just out of control are, are very much in control. Things are happening exactly as they're supposed to happen. It appeared that men were in control, but ac actually God was in control of every, every detail that was occurring. Matthew omits a, a brief trial that occurred before Annas. Annas had been a, the high priest before Caiaphas. He was actually his father-in-law. And he condenses two of the trials before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin into one. They, they kind of had a rapidly assembled, and this is all happening in the middle of the night, a rapidly assembled group of Jewish leaders that sort of had a preliminary hearing after Annas had had his chance to interrogate Jesus. And then there's a more formal meeting of the Sanhedrin again, early morning hours. And they're looking for witnesses to give false testimony. I mean, there's no, no attempt to disguise that. They're looking for, for false testimony uh, to incriminate Jesus. Finally, they find two men uh, that, that seem to be somewhat corrobor cor corroborating in their testimony. And they say, this fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Well, that's, that's an obvious misquote of what Jesus had, had said. Uh, in John chapter 2, we actually learn that there were two clearing of money changers from the temple. The first one happened early in Jesus' ministry, right after he had changed water into wine at the wedding in Cana. That doesn't appear in Matthew's gospel, but it does in John's. And the, the response of the Jews is, what authority, what sign can you give us to, to show us your authority to do this? You don't just go in and turn over tables in the temple courts and, and expect not to be questioned. And Jesus' answer was... Um, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And you say, he was going to destroy it. He said, implied, you, you destroy this temple. Well, nobody understood what he was talking about. He was speaking metaphorically, destroy my body, the temple, and I will raise it up in three days. Nobody got that at the time, but it was certainly not any uh, threat on Jesus' part on the, on the physical temple building, and obviously nobody could rebuild that temple if it were destroyed within three days. But it was enough for the Jewish leaders. Uh, they felt that they had something they could latch on to here, that he was a, he was a threat. And so he is, is questioned, uh, and he, he doesn't give an answer. Uh, he is silent. And that actually fulfills a prophecy from Isaiah chapter 53, which is a, a messianic chapter. Uh, but verse 7 in chapter 53 reads, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. So even this detail, Jesus' silence, is fulfilling prophecy. Well, Caiaphas kind of pivots here. He changes tactics, and uh, he invokes actually a, an aspect of the Jewish law. Uh, he says, I charge you under oath, this is verse 63, by the living God, which the high priest had the right to do, he could, he could compel a witness to testify if he charged him under oath. Um, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Well, Jesus obeys the law, shows uh, uh, respect for that, and his answer is, you have said so. so. He's answering in the affirmative, but 
things are turning here, aren't they? Caiaphas thought he had Jesus on trial. It's actually turning the other direction, and it's Caiaphas who is on trial. Um, he has to answer the question that all men have to answer. What will you do with Jesus? And Jesus continues with, with more prophecy in his answer. He says, I say to, you, to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. That's actually a, a combination of two prophecies, Psalm 110, verse 1, and Daniel 7, verse 13. We saw a couple of weeks ago that, that uh, Jesus' second coming is not going to be a secret. It's going to be very obvious coming on the clouds. And, and this is uh, probably one of Jesus' clearest claims to be the Messiah. And this time it's right in front of the Jewish leadership. Uh, he's essentially saying, you may see me now as a servant who's about to suffer. You will one day in the future see me as a judge who's coming on the clouds. And that will fulfill prophecy. And Caiaphas knew exactly that those were messianic claims. He accuses Jesus of blasphemy, which was really the only other option that he had if he weren't going to acknowledge the truth of what Jesus had just spoken. You know, the number of laws that the Jewish leaders broke in these trials, is, it's hard to get an exact number. It's so large. But let me just throw out a few. Um, in any capital trial, the defense witnesses had to be called first. There weren't any defense witnesses called in this trial. The prosecution uh, witnesses were called first. You couldn't have a capital crime tried at night. It had to be done during the daytime. The, the thinking there was that the, the Sanhedrin, the, the jurors, would, would need to be fully alert. They wouldn't be able to do that at night, and so any capital trial had to take place in the daytime. Jesus was in the hands of Pilate by sunrise. All of this is happening at night. There could not be a criminal trial during Passover. This is the, this is the day before Passover. It's Passover week. They disregarded that. There could not be any decision other than not guilty made on the same day. The thinking was if, if they were going to find a defendant or an accused person uh, guilty, they needed to sleep on that decision for 24 hours, have the potential to change their mind, and then render a final verdict the next day. You can only declare someone not guilty the same day that, that the uh, evidence was presented. Well, they violated that as well. And there was never to be an all in favor, say aye, kind of a decision the way Caiaphas threw it out to them. What do you say? And everyone kind of agrees that the voting would go from the youngest member of the Sanhedrin to the oldest. And again, there seemed to be a good reason for that. You, they didn't want the, the younger members uh, to be swayed by the votes of the more senior members. And so the younger guys would go first all the way up to the most senior member. Well, this was uh, all in favor, say aye, he's guilty. So those are just a few of the violations that took place. And I think it, it speaks to how desperate the Jewish leadership was to, to, uh, uh, to kill Jesus. So... You might think of the Sanhedrin as kind of the Jewish equivalent of our Supreme Court, and what happens next, uh, they spit in his face, struck him with their fists, others slapped him. If you can picture uh, Clarence Thomas getting down from the bench in our Supreme Court, or Samuel Alito, and, and spitting in the face of a defendant and striking him, that's just roughly equally outrageous to what, what's happening here in the Sanhedrin. Um, we'll move on to um, Peter fulfilling what Jesus had told him would happen to Peter. He, uh, he disowns Jesus twice uh, in front of two, two servant girls initially, and then in verse somebody three, someone identifies him by his accent. You know, he was from Galilee. This is largely a a Jerusalem uh, crowd that, that is, is present, and the accents were different. It would be a little bit like somebody from Boston showing up in Tyler and starting to talk, and the immediate reaction would be, you're not from around here, are you? Uh, they recognized that, that uh, Peter was a Galilean. That's the third time that he denies and calls down curses uh, upon himself if he is, if he's in fact lying. He denies Jesus the third time, and then the rooster crows, and Peter remembers what Jesus had told him just a few hours earlier, that, that before the rooster crowed, he would deny him three times. We get from Luke's gospel that, that Peter actually looked 
at Jesus right after the rooster crowed. And uh, I don't imagine Peter ever forgot that look. He was cut to the heart and, and weeps. Um, we move on to chapter 27. There's another man that, that is kind of cut to the heart in a different way. That's Judas. Uh, he sees that Jesus is now fe- facing a death sentence. And, and uh, verse 3 tells us he is seized with remorse. And uh, he tries to return the 30 pieces of silver that the Sanhedrin had paid him for being the informant, uh, which was the price, of course, of a slave. And uh, the priests will have none of that. They, they tell uh, Judas that, that uh, his remorse is not their problem and he's responsible. Um, denying their guilt as part of this doesn't remove it. We'll see Pilate kind of do the trying to do the same thing when he's confronted with Jesus in this purchase of a potter's field um, where Gentiles could be buried. You know, a Gentile couldn't own land in Israel legally, and so if somebody died as a Gentile, a visitor, a foreigner in, in Jerusalem or Israel, where would they be buried? Well, it probably made them feel better that they could purchase this piece of land where, where uh, Gentiles could be, could be buried. But that also fulfilled prophecy uh, kind of a combination there of, of Zechariah along with Jeremiah. It's not uncommon for uh, biblical writers to, if, if two prophets speak to the same thing, they might just name the more well-known prophet, which, uh, which Matthew does here, uh, referring to Jeremiah. But there's actually a more specific prophecy in Zechariah chapter 11 about a potter's field and, and 30 pieces of silver. The question came up in our, our leaders' meeting, you know, Judas and Peter had both failed Jesus um, and both were sorrowful. What, what was the difference? Or did Judas have an opportunity to, to repent? Um, and I guess uh, I would maybe point out a couple of things. One is um, Peter failed in the heat of the moment, right? Uh, Judas was definitely a premeditated betrayal on his part. Uh, J- Judas was legitimately remorseful, sorry for the outcome that had taken place, that he now faced the guilt of having participated in the condemnation of an innocent man. But that is not the same thing as repentance, as turning to Jesus. Um, ultimately, you know, God knows a man's heart, and, and we don't see it as clearly as God does. But uh, I think there are important differences between Peter's remorse, and as we'll see, or as, as Scripture tells us, later being restored by, by Jesus versus Judas and his sorrow, but being racked with guilt is not the same thing as being repentant. Um, may not answer all the questions, but I think there are some distinctions uh, that need to be made between Judas's sorrow and, and Peter's sorrow. So we'll go on to the second division, Jesus before Pilate. Um, you know, the Jews were allowed a fair amount of freedom by the Romans. That was part of their governing policy to let people operate in their religion or whatever their customs were, as long as it didn't interfere with state business. It was generally easier to govern people if you gave them some freedom. But that freedom did not include the ability to execute a prisoner. So if Jesus had been executed by Jewish law, he'd have been stoned, right? That was the Jewish form of capital punishment. But he had to be transferred to Roman jurisdiction because this was a capital crime that they were accusing him of, and so now he's in the hands of Pilate. And just to to summarize uh, Pilate's relationship with the Jewish people, he had been the governor of that region for a number of years at this point, and somewhere between contentious and hostile would maybe be fair to say uh, what what Pilate's relationship with the, the Jewish people was. He hated the Jews. He had gone out of his way to do things that were offensive to the Jews. In fact, he had been reprimanded by Caesar not too far uh, earlier than this. Uh, and so he was prob- that probably explains some of his willingness to try to work it out with the Jewish leadership as far as what to do with Jesus, because he was fairly accommodating, uh, trying to find a solution that could appease everybody. Um, and, and he may have been uh, very sensitive to the fact that he was on somewhat thin ice because of his his hostile relationship with the Jews in Rome, above all else, didn't want trouble in any of the provinces, and, and he was kind of sitting on a bit of a powder keg. So um, 
He asks the question of Jesus, are you king of the Jews? The last time we heard that expression in Matthew's gospel was way back when the wise men were visiting Jerusalem looking for the king of the Jews. We haven't seen that expression again until now. And Jesus gives him the same answer that he gave Caiaphas, you have said so. And as the Jewish leaders present their charges, Jesus is once again silent, which had to amaze Pilate. I'm, he, he had interrogated lots of prisoners and, and I'm sure had expected Jesus to give a vociferous defense of these false accusations. And Jesus says nothing. Um, verse 15 in chapter 27 tells us that, that it was his custom at the festival to release a prisoner that the crowd would choose. This is probably some effort on Pilate's chart part to, uh, to do a little damage control in his relationship with the Jews and maybe appease them somewhat by releasing a, a political prisoner, but he misjudges um, the uh, uh, sentiment of the crowd. He is, you know, Pilate's no fool. He, he knows there's no evidence to convict Jesus. And he knows that the Jewish leadership is not favorably disposed to Rome and they're not looking for an opportunity to turn over somebody who's a political threat to, to Rome. So he sees through the, the motives, I think, of, of the Jewish leadership. But he, he asks the crowd which prisoner he should release, but he completely misjudges their response. He's expecting them to ask for Barabbas, uh, but the Jewish leaders had been hard at work in the crowd, um, probably disseminating the, the charge that Jesus was guilty of blasphemy. Now, remember, this is a Jerusalem-based crowd. They're they're not as familiar with Jesus as the Galileans were, where most of his public ministry had taken place. Probably easier to sway them than it would have been if, if this were all taking place up in Galilee in the north. Um, the other thing about Barabbas is that he was probably somewhat of a folk hero. Now, he's described in the other Gospels as being a, a robber and a murderer, but he was a participant in the insurrection or the revolt. Well, who would he be revolting against? He'd be revolting against Rome. And so he was probably somewhat of a Robin Hood figure uh, to, to the people, uh, guilty of having committed murder and, and robbing, but probably in the cause of trying to lead a failed revolt against Rome. So there probably was some sentiment in the crowd that this guy's going to die, but he's kind of a, a bit of a hero because he's trying to overthrow Rome, which was as we've talked about, kind of a messianic expectation of the Jewish people. So in some ways, Barabbas almost fit their expectation of what a Messiah ought to be doing more than Jesus did. So Pilate's no doubt shocked that, that they want this obviously guilty criminal to, to be uh, released instead of Jesus. And he, he goes on uh, to, to plead with the crowd in, in verses 22 and 23, what shall I do with Jesus? Uh, and they answer, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? And again, the shout comes, crucify him. I almost get the picture. It's like if you've been in a stadium where the, the home team, and basketball, football, and, and uh, the other team's got the ball and the chant of defense, defense, just sort of reverberates through the stadium. Well, it's kind of crucify him, crucify him, reverberating in the crowd, and pilots recognizing that this is about to get out of control. Um, the sentiment is, is turned against him. So he washes his hands, which was probably some disrespect to the Jewish people because of their focus on, on hand washing and declares that he's innocent. Um, kind of as the Jewish leaders had done to, uh, to Judas, that, that he would have no part in this, although you don't get to eliminate your guilt just by saying you're not guilty, do you? Um, despite knowing the truth and despite the warning that his wife had in the dream, he makes the politically expedient decision to release Barabbas and crucify Jesus. Um, so the, the responsibility for Jesus' death was shared by not only the Jewish leaders, um, it was also shared by the crowd, and it was likewise shared by the Gentiles, the Jewish leadership Pilate, their representative, and the, the Gentile commoners, the soldiers, we read at the end of our lesson this week, that the soldiers participated in mocking him and putting a crown of thorns on his head and, and beating him with it. And we'll talk a little bit more about the physical suffering of Jesus next week. Um, this is really the low point of human history, isn't it? The Son of God, completely innocent, 
about to be executed, but was not just a Jewish problem. Um, that verse 25 where, where the crowd says, his blood is on us and on our children is a chilling statement and often used as kind of a basis for anti-Semitism. It is not a legitimate basis for anti-Semitism. The responsibility for Jesus' death was shared both Jew and Gentile and really was shared by all of us. Um, so the, the principles I told you would come at the end here, and really they come from three individuals. The first is Barabbas. Uh, I think we've got a pretty good idea what, what Jesus' night was like. We get the details of that. What do you think Barabbas' night was like before Friday morning? Knowing that he was guilty, knowing that he was facing uh, crucifixion, and then he learns that there's going to be a substitute, that he's going to be set free and someone else is going to be crucified. Now, Barabbas might not have known much about Jesus. We don't really know a lot about him, but I'm sure that he was glad to have Jesus pay his penalty. And we really don't know anything further about what happened the rest of his life. Did he ultimately come to faith in Jesus? Did he live another 30 or 40 years? We don't know anything about Barabbas after that. But this theme of substitution, you can trace that all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 in the garden when Adam and Eve have sinned and they recognize their nakedness for the first time. They put fig leaves on trying to cover themselves and God provides animal skins to clothe them. Well, animals had to die, didn't they, because of Adam and Eve's sin. That's the first thread of substitution we find in the Old Testament. But the whole Jewish sacrificial system was largely based on this idea of substitution. The offerings that were made for sin, a lamb, a goat, a ram, was that animal's life in exchange for the sinner's life, wasn't it? And the, the physical reminder of the seriousness of sin was just a whole lot more vivid in the Old Testament than it is for us. I mean, as the head of a household, you would have the opportunity at some point to go in the temple courtyard, and it wasn't the priest that actually killed the animal. You got to kill the animal that you brought. Maybe it was the favorite lamb that, that your kids had grown attached to, but you would put your hand on that animal's head, and you would draw the knife across its throat and watch as it bled to death, and the priest would hold the bowl and collect the blood. I don't think that image would ever leave you as far as how serious sin is. We don't have that. We don't take animals with us to church anymore. Um, Jesus would provide a permanent payment for our sin problem. And that's the first principle tonight, that Jesus became the substitute we desperately need You know, there was going to be a day that, that Barabbas would have a greater need for a substitute than he had on that day. There would be a day when his eternity would hang in the balance, not just his physical life, but where he would spend eternity. Barabbas was a rebel. He was guilty. You and I are rebels as well. We're all like Barabbas. We all have a sin problem. It doesn't look exactly the same as Barabbas, and yours and mine don't look exactly the same, but we all share the same problem of sin and one day appearing before a holy God. And there are really two options. We can represent ourselves and try to plead a case that the good outweighs the bad, or we've tried hard, or I was in church regularly, or whatever plan person might have to try and represent themselves in their sin, or we can place our faith in Jesus and receive his payment as our substitute. And the outcomes of those two options are about as far apart as they can be, aren't they? One ushers in a trinity of, of unquenchable suffering and, and uh, separation, and the other ushers in eternity with, with God. Do you know that Jesus is your substitute? If that's not clear for you, there is a pamphlet that uh, BSF has that your discussion leader would be glad to uh, pass along to. It's called Am I Sure? And it goes through some, some key verses from the Bible that can help you um, as far as assurance is concerned so that you can know that you know where you're going when, when this life is over. The second individual that will lead into our second principle is Peter. Matthew gives us more detail about Peter than he does about any other disciple. There's no question about Peter's commitment. 
He was also one who was pretty easy for him to step out of God's will when he thought he knew better, wasn't he? Um, up to this point, Peter had relied on Peter as far as his uh, following of Jesus was concerned. It was his commitment, his strength. He certainly had some high points. He, he was the disciple who was willing to get out of the boat and walk on water, at least for a few steps, to meet Jesus in the storm. And he confessed Jesus as Messiah, the Son of the living God, in chapter 16, right before Jesus told him, get behind me, Satan, because Peter objected to Jesus telling the disciples that uh, he was going to be crucified. And he had some really uh, low points as well that come out in our lesson tonight. He's incredibly brave one minute, pulling the sword on the, uh, the servant of the high priest, even though it was out of God's will. And then a few hours later, he's denying Jesus three times. So erratic would be one word that we could apply to Peter and his following of Jesus. He's kind of all over the place, isn't he? That word erratic might not be the exact opposite of faithful, but it's close, uh, erratic and faithful. Um, Peter was a different man after he met the resurrected Jesus and had the Holy Spirit indwell him at Pentecost, wasn't he? Wasn't perfect, but he was faithful. He became a cornerstone of the, of the early church. He quit looking to Peter as the source of his strength and instead looked to Jesus. And that's the second principle tonight, that Jesus provides the power that we need to follow him. Peter might be the best example in the New Testament of what it can look like to try to follow Jesus in your own strength. Now, Peter couldn't do it. At, at best, his results were erratic. How are you and I trying to, to do it? It's not hard to be like Peter and, and try to pull it off relying on ourselves. That, that may be one of the tougher lessons for a Christian to learn, that, that we can't be a faithful follower of Jesus in our own strength. Apart from relying on Jesus and the Holy Spirit, we just don't have the resources, regardless of how strong we might feel our commitment is. We'll be erratic like Peter was erratic, but Jesus does provide the power that we need if we'll turn to him and rely on him and not on ourselves. And the last person was Jesus himself. Um, nothing easy about what Jesus endured that night or early the next morning, falsely arrested, falsely accused, illegal trial, spit on, mocked, struck in the face, flogged. Um, as we've said before, Jesus never used his supernatural powers to serve himself. He endured all of that as a man, submitted to his father's plan. What, what looked to be the worst possible outcome became the best possible outcome. Jesus had to fight to trust that plan in the garden, uh, but he never abandoned that trust. And that's the final principle tonight, that Jesus demonstrates the trust we can have in God's sovereign plans. Don't know what trial you're facing right now. I don't even know what trial might be around the corner for me, and, and certainly I don't know uh, for you trials that might question or cause us to question God's sovereignty but I do know that whatever trial happens to me or happens to you has first passed through God's hands before it hits us. And we have the promises in the Bible that God can use any trial, any suffering for our good. That doesn't mean we get all the answers that we might like to have, but, but we can trust his sovereign plans. There, there are really only two possibilities, right? God's either sovereign or he's not. He is sovereign, and these chapters in Matthew, uh, I think, uh, prove it to us. Let's pray, and we'll, we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for, uh, for your word and, and the uh, uh, look that it gives us uh, in our lesson this week of Jesus and what a uh, magnificent, dignified, submitted, uh, beautiful Savior that he is. And uh, pray that that would resonate with each one of us, that uh, we would recognize him as, as the one who is willing, was willing to substitute for us. If, if man hasn't made that decision, he'd be convicted of his need to make it tonight. And for those of us that have made that decision, uh, that we would recognize that Jesus is the one that uh, will carry us through as 
being faithful followers. We can't pull it off ourselves. We need him, but uh, he is there when we'll turn to him and ask. And uh, we ask that in your son's name. Amen.